Hi, my name is Rene Najera. I'm a doctor of public health and the editor of historyofvaccines.org. I want to talk to you today about vaccine epidemiology, and this is just a very, very simple introduction to vaccine epidemiology. And of course, some of you may be wondering, what does epidemiology mean? Well, epi means on top of or upon. Demos means people. And ology is the study of, right? like biology, physiology, geology. And so this is a study of that which comes upon the people. Uh, we usually associate epidemiology with things like diseases, uh, chronic conditions, that kind of thing. But for today's lecture, I am referring to the epidemiology of vaccines or the effects that vaccines have on the people. Generally, we think that vaccines are good, and they are, that they're effective, and they are, that they're safe, and they are. And so we're going to analyze some of the effects that vaccines have had on the people, on humans, humanity, and throughout history. But we're also going to touch on a couple of instances and a couple of phenomena that are out there that occur with vaccination that may not be as good as you think it is. And we're going to touch upon it, and we're going we're gonna to demystify it so you understand what it is, and you're a little bit better informed of what these things are. The first section we're gonna go through, we're gonna talk a little bit about the history of vaccines. And again, you can visit our website at historyofvaccines.org and read a ton more information about the history of vaccines. This is just a short introduction, just a quick overview of vaccine history. So vaccine history begins back in the late 1700s with Dr. Edward Jenner. Dr. Jenner was a British physician who worked out in the, in the field or out in, in amongst the public. And he was very observant. And he noticed that there were these women who are called milkmaids. And he noticed that they did not have smallpox. They know He noticed that even when there were epidemics of smallpox amongst the people, these women, for the most part, did not contract smallpox. They did, however, contract this other infection called cowpox. And it was a similar infection to smallpox, but it wasn't as generalized throughout the body as smallpox. It didn't cause the horrible scarring that um, smallpox causes. And it certainly didn't kill as many people as smallpox did back then. And so his theory, he was like, hmm, he had all these questions, right? Why is that? And so he theorized that whatever was affecting the these women and giving them cowpox was coming a from the cows <laughs> and b it was giving some sort of immunity to smallpox how he didn't understand exactly how he just theorized again this is before there was a, a an accepted theory of how germs work uh, especially viruses in this case and so what he did is that he took some cow pus and he injected this this boy named james phipps back in 1796 and he gave this pus to him and he developed cowpox and he was fine because, again, it's not as bad as smallpox. And then a few days later, he then gave him a, a dose of smallpox. Lo and behold, little boy Phipps, uh, James, did not develop smallpox. He had become immune to it. So Dr. Jenner repeated this a few times with other people, including some people in his family. And he found case after case where if the person had never had smallpox, Pox, but then they were given cowpox and then they were challenged with smallpox they would not develop small smallpox at the time the custom was to do something called variolation and so variolation meant that a physician was there with you and they gave you smallpox and they they made sure that you had a milder course of the disease but again they were still giving you the full-blown smallpox so you could you could get sick, right? You can develop the full full blown sickness. Uh, but the hope was that by giving you a low grade smallpox under medical supervision, that you would become immune, and that was the practice of the day. Well, so successful was Dr. Jenner with this whole thing that he put it to the well the medical community out there. It got out the word got out that here we have something that is preventing smallpox. It is preventing epidemics of smallpox. Yay, hooray. By 1840, the British government said no more variolation. We're going to do cowpox vaccination. And so the word cow uh, in Latin 
uh, comes from this word vaca. So vaca to vaccination, you can see what they were going on about. And it wouldn't be until 1979 through an intensive program by the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control here in the U.S., health agencies around the world, that they decided to eradicate, and that means completely obliterate the virus from the face of the earth. They did a, a bunch of vaccinations in a bunch of people all over the world. They looked for cases. Whenever a case of smallpox would pop up, they would go in and they would they would see the one person who had it, and they would find all the people around them and vaccinate them with cowpox or uh, the the smallpox vaccine to prevent them from from becoming ill and just completely cut it off and and end it. Like I said, they eradicated smallpox. There's only um, smallpox stockpiles at CDC in Atlanta and in Russia. And it's supposed to be used for research purposes only to keep it around just in case a similar virus comes along that we need to do research in the lab. But it is, it is under very, very tight security. The next step in the history of vaccination comes from Louis Pasteur. He is from France. He's French, uh, Louis Pasteur. And he is the uh, quote unquote father of germ theory. Like I said before, Dr. Jenner, he had this idea that maybe being exposed to something that wasn't as bad as smallpox would give you immunity to smallpox because something was going on inside of you that said, hey, this, this, this thing, whatever this is, it's the same as smallpox. I'm going to be ready for smallpox whenever it comes, or, or comes around, so I'm going to develop immunity. But it wasn't until Dr. Pasteur came up with his germ theory that we understood that it was these germs, these microbes, that actually cause disease. And he did a lot of work in a lot of different areas around Europe, looking at things like chicken cholera, anthrax, and attenuation. And we'll talk about attenuation here when we, we're talking about rabies vaccine and other vaccines. But his whole claim to fame is that people used to think that microbes came out of nowhere, that you could have a glass with broth in it, and then all of a sudden stuff would grow on it like mold or, or, or whatever. And uh, they said, oh, that came out of nowhere. He understood that if this broth was sterilized at a high temperature and it was covered with something to keep all the microbes from falling on it, all the mold, spores, etc., that the broth, nothing would grow on top, on top of the broth. And he conducted several experiments to this effect. And he showed, hey, no, actually, there is such a thing as sterility. There is no such thing as spontaneous generation of life. I, it, you need something to come out of something, and so he was credited with that. Um, other scientists at the time also came up with similar ideas, and it all came right around the time when we were starting to develop microscopes and starting to understand science a little bit better. An interesting, interesting thing about anthrax is that he was uh, pulled into an investigation of anthrax in some cattle. The farmers were like, well, why are these cattle dying of anthrax when I'm not introducing any cattle with anthrax? And he theorized that anthrax was found in spores in the soil and that you didn't need it did not need to be like a person-to-person -person contagion or an animal-to-animal -animal contagion. That animals with anthrax could have deposited the spores in the soil. These spores remain in the soil for a while. The cows would come along and eat the, so eat the grass off the soil. The soil would get onto them and then they would develop anthrax from that. And so that was a big advancement in understanding germs and infection and infectious disease. And so he also experimented by attenuating some, some of these germs. Um, he would make them less harmful. Attenuation is just basically another way of saying that something is made less harmful or rendered safer. It doesn't cause the full-blown disease, but it does cause an immune response. And he didn't, he, he knew about microbes, but he didn't quite understand viruses. He knew that there was some sort of an infectious agent in things like uh, rabbit animals, but he couldn't find it in, in through the micros microscopy because viruses are so tiny. Uh, they're, you know, they're about a thousandth of a, the size of, a, of an actual microbe uh, at some points. And so it's really hard to see them in the microscope. But he understood that there was something there. So for rabies vaccine, he would grow rabbits that would he would then expose them to rabies or to a rabbit animal, and they they would develop rabies. He would kill them, and then he would take the brains and put them in formaldehyde, and then he would dry them out and make a powder out of those brains. And from that powder that was really dry and it was had been processed by formaldehyde, the virus was then attenuated. It wasn't killed. It was attenuated, and that's important because it 
if a killed virus gives a little bit less of an immune response than an attenuated virus, generally you want attenuated viruses because they they give a better response. The problem with that is that you need to keep the vaccines in a in a good environment. We'll talk about that later. Here, this powder he injected uh, injected it into a boy from Germany who had been bitten by a rabbit animal, and he uh, basically prevented rabies in that child by giving the immunity via the attenuated virus first instead of the actual full-blown disease. Later experiments showed that giving the attenuated virus gave immunity. And from knowing these things about broth and high temperatures, we get things like pasteurization of consumable products like milk. So now we don't have to worry about tuberculosis in our milk because it gets pasteurized, kills all the tuberculosis bacteria in it and other, and other such germs. And the milk that you get, I hope, at the store is pasteurized and uh, basically sterile. Now, in modern times, we have uh, still going on a lot of research into vaccines. A lot of very bright people are working on vaccine science and new vaccines and better ways of doing vaccination strategies and understanding things. E Ebola pops up and we need an Ebola vaccination. Zika pops up and we need a Zika vaccination. A lot of people are doing a lot of this work. Dr. Paul Offit worked on the rotavirus vaccine. Uh, rotavirus, big cause of diarrhea in a lot of young people around the world. But with this rotavirus vaccine, that is not being seen as much. A lot of children are making it to their fifth year of life without dying from dehydration, from this bad diarrhea, from this virus. Certainly can be credited with saving tons and tons of lives, maybe in the millions. Dr. Stanley Plotkin, he worked on the rubella vaccine. Rubella, a very bad infection, respiratory infection with a virus can cause congenital rubella syndrome in which a pregnant woman who gets rubella, the child may be born with severe, very horrible abnormalities. With this vaccine, almost 100% effective. Basically, in the United States, we don't see rubella anymore. Back in the 1960s, you can look for some of the headlines if you Google rubella 1960s epidemic. A lot of women who were pregnant were very worried about getting uh, rubella and giving congenital rubella syndrome to their child. A lot of children were born with this disease who are now older adults that you can see if they made it, you know, because they, they might have died at birth, but you see the deformities and the handicaps that this, this virus caused. So certainly credited with saving a lot of lives. And then there's the scientists at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. They're finding better ways of doing a Zika virus uh, and other arboviral infection vaccines. So they're at the forefront, the cutting edge of vaccine technology right now. As I said, it's going on, it's, it's being worked on. A lot of this research not only comes with looking at effectiveness, uh, it, it's also looking at safety. And, and then we epidemiologists, uh, public health people out in the real world, <laughs> the lab is still real, but us out in the field, we need to look into policy. You know, what do we do once we have a vaccine, for example, against Zika? Do we give it to only women because Zika causes deformities in the unborn child? Do we only give it to pregnant women, again, because it only causes deformities in the unborn child? Or do we give it to everybody? And do we only do that? Do we only do vaccination and forget about doing mosquito control? Obviously not. We want to control the mosquitoes and we also want to give the vaccines. But these are a lot of the things that we work on in policy, not just in research. Finally here, I want to show you a timeline of the vaccines and their development beginning in 1798 with Dr. Jenner's smallpox vaccine. Then Pasteur steps in and does the chicken cholera vaccine, the rabies vaccine. Then we have diphtheria antitoxin. So diphtheria is a bacterial infection that uh, where a toxin is released by the bacteria and the antitoxin would attack the the toxin and just uh, get it out of your system. Later on, we developed this toxoid, which is a, a, a toxin-like substance that was given to people. So then it wouldn't be the antitoxin getting rid of the toxin. It would be the immune system getting rid of the, getting rid of the toxin. So it was kind of like a, a way to immunize you against toxin, not necessarily against the bacteria. Uh, we had vaccines for pertussis, whoop, whooping cough, diphtheria toxoid, just like the tetanus toxoid. Instead of giving you the immunity against the bacteria, it also gives you the immunity against the toxin. Tuberculosis uh, still being given around the world, not in the United States anymore because we have better ways of dealing with tuberculosis, but certainly a lot of people from uh, a lot of parts of the world are getting the BCG vaccine. Yellow fever, still required in a lot of in a lot of places in South America and Africa. If you arrive, for example, in South Africa and you don't have your yellow fever vaccine, 
Good luck, you're not getting in. They'll put you on a plane and send you back home. Influenza vaccine, not until 1942. Remember, in 1918, we had the very big pandemic of influenza. There was no vaccine available then because we didn't even know what was causing this influenza. We knew what to call it, influenza, but we didn't know what was causing it, which was the influenza virus. And it wouldn't be until the 19, late 1930s that the virus was discovered. And then in the 1940s, the vaccine was developed. Polio, very big, very big vaccine. Uh, we're about to eradicate polio from the face of the earth, just like we did smallpox. It's taken a while, but it, we're getting there. There's a couple of pockets in Nigeria and uh, Pakistan of, of polio, but it's being worked on. Uh, never fear, it'll get done. A measles vaccines, like I said, uh, 1960s, mumps, rubella, very big to prevent all those uh, infant deaths. Pneumococcal vaccination, meningococcal vaccinations, hepatitis B vaccination, Haemophilus influenza B, Japanese encephalitis, chickenpox vaccination, very big in the U.S. to prevent childhood uh, disease of chickenpox. And we're going to talk about the effect of things like chickenpox and measles vaccines on the population called the epidemiological shift. So stay tuned for that. That is actually one of the things that you might want to look at when it, somebody says, do vaccines cause any adverse ev events? The answer is yes. And we're going to talk about those those two things, the epidemiological shift and other things, and you'll see why it is a bad thing, but it's not as bad as, as you think it would be. Uh, rotavirus later on with uh, Dr. Offit, as I, as I said, and other vaccines, Lyme disease and anthrax. And there's more research going on now, like I said, into Zika and other, and other diseases. So this concludes the short history of vaccines. Stay tuned for the next chapter in this, in which we're going to talk about some basic concepts in vaccine epidemiology like immunology, bacteriology, and virology. Thank you.